This Week in the News. Mega Corporation Google LLC seeks to thrust the world into a post-industrial dystopia by releasing a video game streaming platform. That's a bit dramatic. Hey folks, this is Ranker with a gaming news wrap-up video where we discuss the happenings of the week. This week's topics include the unveiling of Google's big new streaming platform, Stadia. The reveal to sequels to classic games in the System Shock and Vampire the Masquerade series. A roundup of action RPG news and more. As always, discussion timestamps can be found in the video description. But right before you skip ahead, just a quick reminder to ring the sub notification bell to be alerted of new Saturday episodes. In our first story here, the trailer for Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines 2 has released and man does it look good. Fans have been waiting for a new vampire game for so long. And even if you're not a fan, this trailer looks really enticing. The game basically revolves around a civil war between vampire factions in modern day Earth. We dive into conspiracies, we get to explore vampire society and their blood trade. And overall, I just highly encourage you to check out the trailer yourself. Link in the video description. On to some very quick Grim Dawn news. The action RPG and its current expansions are currently on sale on Humble Bundle. The base game is 70% off, the expansions 30 and 25% off, and this of course is all building up to their latest expansion release on March 27th. Forgotten Gods. This week also saw the launch of the trailer for System Shock 3. Now I was excited when I found out about the trailer, but then I watched it and I became much less excited. But let's go back in time a bit, in case you're not familiar with the System Shock franchise. The first game released in 1994, developed by Looking Glass. It was a cyberpunk game about a hacker seeking to thwart an AI. It was an innovative game at the time, and it was well received by critics, but for whatever reason, it just didn't sell enough copies to turn a profit. System Shock 2 released in 1999, again receiving critical acclaim, but once again, failing to meet sales expectations. So by the year 2000, Looking Glass had to shut its doors. Some key personnel from Looking Glass moved on to other teams and other projects, and Deus Ex in 2000 was a spiritual successor to System Shock, as was Bioshock, released in 2007. Then in 2012, Night Dive Studios acquired the rights to the System Shock franchise and released enhanced editions of the two games over the next few years, before they started working on a full remake on the Unreal 4 engine, something that won't release before the year 2020. So we've known for a while that this reboot or remake project has been in the works, but now we find out that Other Side Entertainment, which was founded by one of Looking Glass's co-founders, had been able to acquire a license from Night Dive to develop System Shock 3. So knowing that one of the original co-founders is behind System Shock 3 does give me some degree of hope. Because before that I thought, oh, it's just some company acquired the rights and they're making this and it's gonna be bad. But despite this, this hope, and I do have trust and faith in this co-founder, Paul Neurath, there's just something off about the teaser that I can't quite put my finger on. Maybe it's just me, and I hope it's just me, but I encourage you folks to watch the trailer, have a look, and give your thoughts. And let me know, have you played the games? Are you familiar with System Shock? If so, do you think this will be a good sequel? And if you're not familiar with the franchise itself, does this trailer make it look like it's going to be a good game? Sound off in the comments. Before we go on, I'd like to take a minute for a word from this video's sponsor, ExpressVPN, whom we've spoken about before. Last summer, I'm paying for a meal at a restaurant when my credit card is declined. I call up my credit card company. Turns out there was a suspicious charge coming out of Europe. We canceled the card, issued a new card, but that got me real paranoid. I do a lot of online shopping. I buy games online. I buy PC parts online. And if you're using Wi-Fi, anyone else on your network could potentially try to gain access to your private data. And a VPN adds an extra layer of protection by encrypting your data from other people on your network. ExpressVPN is one of the top rated VPNs out there with some of the fastest speeds and servers in 94 countries. 
They offer apps not just for your computer, but also for your mobile devices. And it's super easy to set up and use, be it the app itself or the Chrome extension. ExpressVPN costs less than $7 per month with a 30-day money-back guarantee. And you can get three months free if you take the one-year package by clicking the link in the video description, expressvpn.com slash Riker. All right, on to our biggest story of this week, Google Stadia. This was a big reveal by Google this week. This is Google hitting the gaming scene in a major way. To summarize the idea as briefly as possible, they want to become the Netflix of gaming. Now, the idea of streaming games has been around for a long time. Other companies are doing it, like NVIDIA. But none have really kicked off to a level of appreciable success. And what we're talking about when we're talking about game streaming is just like with Netflix, that you don't own any of the movies or TV shows. You just click a button and bam, you're watching The Office. With Google Stadia or other game streaming services, you click a button and you're playing a game. The game does not reside on your computer or your Xbox or your smartphone, whatever the case may be. The game is being run and rendered on Google servers and then being broadcast to you over the internet. And what Google is promising is that they can deliver 4K resolution at 60 FPS. Now, we did mention that this is not a new concept. I remember going to E3 2012 and seeing NVIDIA's demonstration of its streaming service. So what is Google bringing to the table? Well, for one, their massive server infrastructure. They have data centers located worldwide, so they have the hardware to deliver a streaming service that would be superior to any that is out there currently. You would access Google Stadia through Google Chrome, so any device that can run Google Chrome should be able to stream games from. They had a nifty little demonstration of you basically watching a trailer for Assassin's Creed, for instance, and there's a play now button that appears and you click it and within five seconds you are in and playing the game. There's an appeal to that, to be five seconds away from looking at a game and playing it. No download time, no install time. And I think one feature that's not being discussed very much but is very interesting is the ability to save a state, a game state. So imagine that I'm about to start a rift or a greater rift in Diablo 3 and I save my game state and I send it to all you folks and then I do the rift and then we all do that exact same rift and we see who gets the best time. We're basically creating our own challenge rift. Now apparently you should be able to use any form of controller, be it keyboard, mouse, or existing console controllers, though they are trying to peddle their own proprietary controller. And while there have been no discussions about pricing, it's pretty obvious that it's going to be subscription-based, like Netflix. They have to pay for those game licenses somehow. And they had a close beta running in fall of 2018 with a release planned for this year. Now the obvious advantages to streaming games rather than owning games is one hardware. You don't have to have a great computer because your computer isn't doing any of the rendering. If you can watch Netflix, then you can play the latest and greatest game on max resolution graphics because it's Google's computers that are doing all the rendering. You also don't have to buy the game. You can sort of use this as a service to test out games. Maybe if you're just going to play a game for a couple of hours, then do you really want to have spent $60 on it? But there are, of course, obvious disadvantages, and it seems a lot of people are concerned about where the industry is headed and what a Google monopoly might do to the industry. The obvious major concern is that while, yes, that means you don't have to have a great computer, you do have to have a great internet connection. Sure, the Google servers can handle sending you 4K at 60 FPS, but if your internet connection is not up to speed, no pun intended, then you're going to have a bad time. For instance, Australia is a place where it's notoriously difficult to get access to really good internet, so this would be basically close to impossible uh, to take off in Australia. Besides that, even if you have the internet speed to absorb all that incoming data, your ISP may throttle you at some point if there's just too much data. Or maybe you have the speed, but you don't have the reliability of connection, and you're going to get issues periodically throughout your experience. Or maybe you're going to start running into data limits. I read a figure that streaming through Google Stadia could be costing you 20 gigabytes per hour. But it seems the biggest concern overall for most gamers is input lag. 
We want games to feel responsive. We want there to be as little time as possible, no discernible time at all, between our input, our pushing a button on our keyboard or mouse or controller, and that command being executed in the game. In the past, this is part of the reason why competitive FPS players would always use wired connections, never a wireless mouse, because it introduces a slight amount of input lag. And now if we're talking about broadcasting our inputs over the internet, we have to send our input through the internet to Google, then Google has to send that all back to us. There's a lot more room for slowdowns here. But surprisingly, a lot of people who participated in the beta have come up and said, you know what, the experience was pretty good. No discernible input lag. Now, of course, there are exceptions. There are some people that did say, yes, they did notice some input lag, but it does seem that the majority of people that partook in the beta had a positive experience. That said, I imagine that this is still not something for competitive gamers, because even if there is no discernible input lag to the average gamer, competitive gamers are going to be looking for every little bit of advantage, and especially in a FPS game, a Twitch shooter, where every millisecond starts to count, I can definitely see this not being for them. But I think that's the key here, that this doesn't have to be for everyone. You know, for us PC Gamer Master Race people, we're probably not going to want to adopt this. But for the average gamer, not having to spend hundreds of dollars on a console or a PC, plus the convenience of being able to just play any game instantly, no download on any system, I think is going to outweigh for them any minimal amount of input lag they may have. This is, of course, assuming they have the internet connection to handle it. Now, I know a lot of people are doom and gloom about this, feeling threatened that this is going to take over and then us PC Gamer Master Race people or whatever, hardcore gamers, we're going to become dinosaurs and then we won't be able to get computers anymore and we're going to have to adopt these services. Call me naive, but I don't believe things will go that way. I'd like to believe that there will still be enough market share of people like you and me who want to be able to own games and run them offline. But then I think about Netflix and has Netflix destroyed the DVD business? Now, one mixed blessing and curse of streamed games is that none of the game files reside on your system, therefore it's a lot more difficult to cheat, but it's a lot more difficult to mod the game as well. For me, modding has always been one of my favorite parts of PC gaming. But again, what it comes down to for me is that if this is a way to make gaming more accessible to people, then I have to be for the idea. And I'm talking real games here. Because I know the whole argument about making gaming more accessible to people can be countered with, oh, well, you know, Facebook games and this and that. So that's what you want, huh, Riker? No, no. I'm talking about taking real hardcore games that real hardcore gamers play and allowing people that don't have hundreds of dollars to spend to be able to play these games and even maybe play them with us because... I got buddies who used to be PC gamers and then they, they got older and now their computers are kind of outdated and they can't run the latest games and they can't justify the expense in their lives right now. But these people sure watch the hell out of Netflix. Now before I turn the question to you folks to get your thoughts, I'd like to highlight some of the thoughts of John Carmack, the John Carmack of id Software, who innovated in the realm of gaming and continues to. On Twitter, he said, quote, I have been saying for a long time that game streaming has a significant future. Not necessarily for everything, but the consumer advantages are large and we can fight the problems. And he points out that many people play games on TVs with so much processing lag that the pixels might as well have been coming from a data center. Not everyone knows or bothers to enable game mode, sadly. For that matter, folks, if you play games on a TV and not a computer monitor, it's not the same. I know some people are like, well, why should I spend X on a computer monitor? I can get a, a TV that's much larger for the same price. TVs are not monitors. There's a difference. And if you don't notice it, that's okay. But it also probably means you wouldn't notice a difference in the slight input lag that the Google Stadia would introduce. Carmack went on to say, quote, I think the world is definitely better with Netflix in it than just DVDs. And the push for someone to be the Netflix of gaming will be a net positive. Everything is a trade-off. There are some games that streaming would do severe damage to, but there are others where it will work well. It isn't going to replace everything. So now I turn the question to you folks. What are your thoughts on Google Stadia? Do you embrace it? Do you think you'll use it? Are you opposed to it and wish it were not a thing? 
sound off in the comments. But as always, let's keep it civil, folks. All right, on to some quick TV news. Stranger Things 3. The trailer has been revealed, and I gotta say it looks promising. I was a huge fan of the first season. The second season was okay. I enjoyed it, but not as much as the first. I'm a little skeptical about the third, but I have hope, especially toward the end it started to win me back. What are your thoughts? And in one last bit of movies and TV news here. Now, this is a rumor, but coming from a reputable source, StarWarsNews.net. Now, a contact who has allegedly worked on every Disney Star Wars film has told them that the next Star Wars film, which is going to begin filming in fall, will be basically an Old Republic film. And it's going to be headed by Game of Thrones showrunners David Benioff and D.B. Weiss. Quote, Disney wants to open up the Star Wars timeline and appeal to a more Game of Thrones style audience. So the timeline is hundreds of years prior to the Skywalkers, so think almost Star Wars meets Lord of the Rings. I really hope this is all true because this news excites me. I love Game of Thrones. I love the Old Republic era of Star Wars. I find it hard to believe that Disney would be doing something Game of Thrones style. But for the time being, it seems like this is the closest we're going to get to a Knights of the Old Republic movie. And that's awesome. On to some Path of Exile news. The devs released a blog post explaining some upcoming improvements to Synthesis. And it seems these improvements will address many of the complaints that people have with the League. And there's a lot. In the meantime, though, they have at least increased map drop rates which makes mapping more sustainable that was a complaint in the past week and this leads into an interesting discussion raised by the community surrounding well there's a lot of content in this game a lot of different activities and mechanisms you could interact with you can go mapping you can go delving you can do the temple you can run synthesis but the game doesn't just let you pick one activity that you enjoy doing and keep doing it for as long as you want you have to engage with many of these activities in order to sustain doing the activity that you like most. So the question is, why won't the game just let me pick the activity that I find most fun and just run that activity? And I turn the question to you folks. What do you think about this? Do you feel that players should be able to just engage with the one activity that they find most fun without limitations? Sound off in the comments. On to some Diablo news. As we previously discussed, Diablo fans officially shut down on March 21st. It is now in archive mode. You can still view it, but you can no longer submit any new builds. There will be no new news. This is a big loss to the Diablo community, but the silver lining is that the website will at least remain up in archive mode. As a follow-up to last week's news topic about the renewed rumors about a Diablo Netflix series, we've got a tweet here from Andy Cosby saying, quote, It's killing me that I can't talk openly about my new super secret project. Because my new super secret project is just so freaking cool. Soon. Very soon. Now, Andy Cosby is the person who, back in September, when we first discussed these rumors, basically did a big ol' oopsie and confirmed on Twitter that he was in talks to showrun a Diablo series and deleted that tweet within hours or the next day when he realized he screwed up colossally. So the fact that this tweet now comes back around the time that we have the trademark or the copyright filed for a Diablo TV series basically confirms that uh, he wasn't actually fired uh, for leaking that information and this project is still underway and we're going to get real details soon. Hopefully not a blizzard soon, but a very soon. And since we also have rumors about a Diablo 2 remaster in the works, I just wanted to uh, point you folks to something that maybe what a Diablo 2 remaster would look like. Basically, Reddit user Jakeism here has used essentially what is an AI that upscales low-resolution images into high-res images. And here is one result with a Diablo 2 sprite that looks absolutely fantastic. Now, I've seen these AIs do their work before. The results can be very mixed. Sometimes they look great, sometimes they look terrible, but this one came out really good. And that is going to wrap up this week's video. As a reminder, if there is a news topic you'd like to see me cover in a future episode, go ahead and submit that to the subreddit. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my Twitch, Patreon, and now YouTube supporters for making these videos possible. If you like what you see on this channel and want to support the creation of more content, you can consider becoming a supporter on Patreon and YouTube, unlocking access to behind-the-scenes content 
and my eternal gratitude. If you enjoyed this video, please share it, check out these other videos, and subscribe to join Rikers Raiders for more gaming content.